let's see if this thing works okay it seems to be working now i'm not sure it says live let's see okay so at least you can see the video over here this thing works okay okay i just want to make sure that it works i uh, started uh, this i posted about this uh, stream only a few hours ago so uh, i'm not sure if anyone will show up uh, i should have uh, planned this a bit better just to give you a, a couple of days uh, notice uh, two days in advance uh, but here we are i woke up this uh, morning i was writing about uh, this and then i thought okay how about we make a live stream out of it so there are some people in the chat uh, hello everyone, uh, Sheik and Oshirsum, hello there, uh, and uh, Zolt, <laughs> hello Zolt, nice to see you here, uh, it works, okay, that's good, um, we start, uh, Alvaro, hello, uh, we start uh, at uh, 3 o'clock, so we still have uh, seven, uh, 7 minutes to go, I just wanted to uh, start this a bit early to make uh, sure that uh, everything is in order. Uh, so unlike uh, other uh, live streams, uh, today I haven't prepared a presentation where I will talk about uh, some intersection between philosophy and uh, Emacs. Uh, instead, I will just offer a status update on what I have been doing uh, lately with uh, my uh, Emacs related uh, projects. Uh, so hello, hello. Uh, um, by the way, uh, this um, setup that I have over here is uh, new. Uh, as you may know, I was using the binary space partitioning window manager, BSPWM, uh, but uh, I made an exchange uh, of monitors with a friend of mine uh, who needed to have uh, my display, which is 1080p. It is uh, 1920 by 1080p, and he needed to have a dual monitor setup for some work that he is doing. And he gave me this monitor over here, which is uh, wide uh, screen so it is the resolution is uh, 2000 uh, something I forget uh, maybe we can go to uh, Herbsluft and let's see monitor monitor so yeah the resolution is this one over here uh, 2560 uh, times uh, 1080 uh, pixels so what this practically means is that a portion of the screen is the 1080, the regular 1920 by 1080. And then you have a, a sidebar, so to speak, on the side, which is the extra space of the monitor. Uh, so, uh, hello, Madagascar. Okay, that's some exotic place. Uh, so, hello to you. Uh, so yeah, there is this extra space in the monitor. So basically, I have uh, since been using uh, Herbsluft WM. And the reason I am doing that is because uh, Herbsluft allows you to essentially crop the display and say, okay, I want a, a portion of the display to be monitor one and the other portion to be uh, monitor two, etc. So you can simulate a multi-monitor setup even though this is just one physical uh, display so i have been using uh, herbsluft uh, for maybe a month now i'm not sure actually when was the first uh, commit about this uh, on november 8th so yeah it's uh, a bit uh, less than a month that i have been using this setup and uh, my friend will eventually want the monitor back i'm not sure when but until then i am enjoying this setup it works uh, very well indeed uh, so let's go back to uh, our uh, presentation today uh, sorry uh, what do we have here okay uh, so i will wait uh, three more minutes just to be exactly on time uh, with regard uh, to this uh, presentation uh, I want to make um, a test today with a slightly different format for the presentation. Normally, I use a package called org tree slide, and what that package does is it takes sorry it takes the uh, heading of org and it turns it into its own uh, slide. So basically, what it does it is it is uh, narrowing to the heading 
maybe I cannot narrow to this specific heading, but it is uh, just showing you that portion of uh, the file. And then uh, you go to a next heading, which, which looks like the next slide of the presentation. Instead, I want to uh, use just a regular org file. I have just centered the text on display with the help of uh, Olivetti mode. Uh, so I will just be uh, scrolling, doing uh, a regular scroll like this and see how it goes. Uh, so that's uh, the basic idea for this uh, different uh, format. So just that. Otherwise, it is uh, exactly what I was using before. So let's uh, give it a couple of more uh, minutes. And of course, because this is a live stream, if you have any questions, you can uh, ask me over here and uh, I will uh, reply to them uh, uh, as soon as I can. Right away, mostly, but uh, if not, as soon as I can. Uh, so uh, that's it for now. Uh, and here is the text of the presentation. Actually, before we do the stream, let me quickly uh, post this uh, on my website. So this is um, the announcement on my website. Uh, the text of the presentation. Uh, I am uh, editing this now, so it will have to be like this. Uh, and uh, let's write here, sorry, edit, and let's uh, do it like this, maybe. Added the text of the presentation. Uh, and I will edit the, less, the rest of the text uh, afterwards. Uh, so let's uh, commit uh, the change. Uh, so update latest code look this is internal uh, just for me uh, with text of presentation okay and we can push this uh, by the way i have been using um, uh, vc the built-in version control framework for emacs for all uh, simple uh, git related uh, operations uh, but for anything uh, more uh, complex uh, I always revert uh, to, I always uh, use uh, Magit. So there is that. Uh, hello, everyone uh, in the chat uh, from India, Indonesia, Madagascar. So we have uh, people from uh, all uh, from different parts of the world. And I am uh, in, um, in between a, a few, uh, in between three continents uh, in uh, Cyprus. Uh, so we are in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so uh, let me start. It's uh, three o'clock exactly. So let me start uh, with uh, today's uh, live stream with uh, what I have prepared for you today. Uh, so yes, as I said, uh, the live chat is there. If you want to make uh, any questions, I can uh, answer them uh, right away. So I just want to uh, offer you an overview of what I have been uh, doing lately uh, with uh, my Emacs related uh, projects. I will talk about uh, some of uh, the packages uh, that I maintain, that I have written and uh, maintain. And uh, towards the end of the presentation, also make a brief note about EmacsConf 2021. So, of course, uh, as always, uh, my name is Protesilaos, also known as Prot. So this is kind of a, of a meme at this point, but I uh, keep using that intro uh, despite of it. So let's start right away with uh, the first uh, package, which is uh, called LIN. Uh, this is an acronym for LIN is noticeable, a recursive acronym and uh, a, a relevant patch uh, that I have prepared for upstream Emacs for the hlline.el package. So uh, Lin lets you um, specify uh, the line highlight face, the style of the line height face for any buffer you want. And uh, I will show you what I mean uh, in practice. I have written about 
lin, but I will show you what I mean right now. Let's go, for example, uh, to my uh, email client over here, and let's just, this is just the Emacs uh, bug uh, uh, mailing list for bugs, the bug tracker. So you can see here that the highlighted line is blue. Uh, but if I go back to my uh, presentation, let's go to uh, the presentation that we have over here and let's enable the highlight, the line. You see, because maybe if I do it like this, so you see that the line in the top buffer is a light gray. In the bottom buffer, it is a more prominent blue. This is because of uh, Lin, the package that I'm uh, just talking about. And this allows you to remap the highlight uh, to what is appropriate for the current context. In the context of a male client, what you do is you select the thing on the current line, what is relevant on the current line. Whereas in an ordinary buffer, for example, when you are typing some text over here, uh, some some text over here, you are not really selecting the line, so you don't really need a super prominent uh, color uh, for the line uh, highlight. So Lin basically allows you uh, to do uh, this sort of thing. It allows you uh, to uh, exactly uh, be specific with your styles. So uh, there is uh, this, uh, um, the code, you can find it. There is a link to it uh, over here. And uh, the manual explains how you can set it up. And uh, it's very easy to get started with it. If you are on, uh, on the Mac, the Mac OS, uh, there is also a section in the manual which explains how you can get the color, the line selection color uh, of Mac OS for uh, Emacs, for uh, Lin. Uh, and uh, basically, I tried to submit the package to GNU Elpa. There is no package yet. Uh, but I was instead told uh, that it was better to uh, refashion it and uh, convert it into a patch for Emacs directly. Uh, I prepared the patch, but my documentation was a bit too technical. So the maintainers asked me to, if I could rewrite it and uh, simplify it a bit uh, for uh, new users to make sense of things. Uh, I have not done that yet. I will do it hopefully uh, this week. And I have and I include the patch over here in this file in case you want to check it out. But of course, I will uh, update it. I will change uh, the patch. Uh, even if we submit the patch, even if it is accepted uh, upstream, I still think that Lin uh, still has a role to play. It is still useful because you can just use it right away. You don't need to use the latest version of Emacs. You don't need to build it from source. And also, you won't be depending on whether a major mode has uh, um, followed upstream what is happening in Emacs and has made the relevant uh, changes. Whereas with Lin, you just enable Lin where you want and it works uh, right away uh, where you need it. Uh, so I must uh, thank the people who have uh, thus far contributed to Lin. It's Christian Tietz, Damien Cassou, and Nicolas de Jäger. So uh, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, again, hello everyone uh, in the chat, those of you who are uh, joining uh, now. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I will, I will join the chat again. And if you have any questions, uh, I will help you uh, answer them. Uh, I will help you find an answer. So yeah, let's, um, let's ignore this now, the patch. You can check it out. I just uh, pushed it on my website. Uh, in the chat, there is a link uh, to my website for this specific uh, presentation. So you can find the text uh, over there. Uh, let's move on to the next package. And this one is uh, the package called mini buffer and completions in tandem, also known as MCT. And you can find the relevant sources over here. MCT has a package. It is on GNU Elpa. You just type package install and then MCT 
and it will uh, show up. Oh, there is also David Wilson in the chat. Hello, David. Hello there. And David is in Athens right now. So, of course, we are on the same time zone and uh, things will happen eventually. I'll get to that uh, a bit later in, in the presentation. Uh, so, as I was saying, uh, MCT uh, exists as a package uh, format, so you can get it uh, from there. And uh, I, I did a video about this um, in uh, October, so I showed how MCT works. But basically, it is a very thin layer of interactivity over the default uh, mini buffer uh, completion framework. So, um, what you get over here, so this is the mini buffer over here where the cursor is and this over here with the blue line is the completions buffer the standard completions buffer i am not doing anything fancy to it all i am doing here is providing the necessary commands that let you interact with it a bit more effectively than what than what emacs provides uh, out of the box so you just select it's what you have come to expect from uh, third-party packages and I am just trying to offer this with the standard uh, Emacs completion uh, framework. So MCT uh, is something that I have been using in one form or another for almost a year now and I think it works uh, quite uh, well actually. Um, it is a fairly minimalist package and because of that it combines uh, very nicely with other uh, such uh, tools. For example, Daniel Mendler's consult package, Omar Antolin Camarena's uh, Embark uh, package, and of course, uh, with uh, extensions uh, to consult, like consult deer from Karthik Chikmagalur, consult not much by Jose Antonio Ortega Ruiz, and also the all uh, the icons completion by Itai uh, Efrat. And there are other packages like orderless, the completion style, by Omar, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the thing with MCT right now, and uh, the reason I want to cover this right now, is that it does not support in-buffer completion. So when the, the standard completion you get with tab while you are typing, so this one does not work with MCT because that type of completion does not activate the mini buffer. That type of completion only pops up the completions buffer, but the mini buffer uh, is uh, nowhere to be seen. So MCT will not uh, do anything useful in that context. Uh, however, we are making uh, some uh, work on that front. I am. Uh, I am receiving help from uh, Daniel Mendler. So Daniel is, of course, an expert when it comes to uh, those things, at least in my opinion. Uh, and uh, Daniel uh, will help me uh, make this uh, happen so that uh, MCT will work uh, everywhere. Uh, but of course, it will only do so uh, optionally. So uh, it won't uh, interfere if you don't want it. Uh, to interfere with uh, in-buffer uh, completion. Uh, uh, Daniel, of course, is the author of Corfu. This is a package uh, that does uh, in-buffer uh, completion by means of a pop-up. So uh, you can always use MCT with Corfu, as is the case with my own uh, workflow. This is what I have been using for several months now. A quick joke here, uh, MCT stands for Mini Buffer and Completions in Tandem. Uh, but a user observed that if I were to uh, make it work uh, for completion in region, I would need to find a different name for it. So that would have been very unfortunate. Uh, I explained that we cannot change the name for technical reasons, but then I observed that, of course, uh, because this is an acronym, we can interpret it differently. So from now on, uh, MCT will mean Mini Buffer Confines Transcended. So that was uh, the idea. Of course, these are the kind of one-liners that only work uh, face to face, but still. 
Uh, the project is new, but I wish to thank everyone who has uh, contributed uh, thus far. Uh, the list of names is over here. I won't go uh, through it, just uh, in the interest of uh, brevity. So let's move on to uh, the Modus Themes uh, version uh, 2. So this is uh, a major uh, refactoring uh, or a major cleanup, a major review uh, of the project. In case you don't know, the modus themes are a pair of themes, modus operandi and modus vivendi, uh, that are designed in accordance with the highest uh, accessibility standard for legibility. The themes are included in Emacs 28 and, of course, Emacs 29. They are in the Emacs uh, source code. Uh, so I have been uh, making a progress towards uh, version 2.0, and this involves reviewing all the packages that we support uh, at the theme level, making sure that they are still relevant, making sure that the faces that they use are still what we want them to be, uh, checking everything to see uh, if uh, it continues to work as expected and so on. So there is a lot of work behind the scenes, a lot of work where I install the package and uh, uh, run it with the themes and uh, make sure that everything works. There is some work that you do see, of course, and this is the commits that I make when I need to make some changes, refine the code, and or uh, make uh, tweaks to uh, the supported packages. I have uh, removed some uh, packages from the supported uh, list, the list of supported packages, because they were either obsolete or we didn't have to uh, provide explicit support for them because their faces were well defined and uh, did not need any further uh, intervention. Uh, of course, uh, if, the, if I have made a mistake, uh, you are welcome to inform me about it and I will uh, rectify it right away. Uh, there is uh, an issue in my GitLab repo uh, that you can check and it tracks the progress uh, for version 2.0. There is also uh, a file, again, I provide this uh, below. Uh, there is a file in org notation, which uh, has timestamps and uh, to do and all that uh, stuff you have come to expect from org. And you can check that as well. Note, however, that this thing here that I posted on my website is relevant as of this date over here, date and time. Uh, of course, uh, I will uh, be making more progress, so it will soon be out of date. But just something for you to get an idea. I will publish the final uh, file uh, together with the release notes of version 2.0. As always, the release notes are very comprehensive uh, and they cover every change uh, in detail. Uh, let's just check the chat very quickly because before I proceed. Uh, a little bit of hyperbole in the naming isn't out of the ordinary, says David. And that's, of course, true. Uh, we need to be um, a bit uh, sarcastic sometimes, make the occasional joke and uh, be self-deprecating. I have an Easter egg. There is a package I have called Let's Do This. It wasn't. Um, part of the plan, but let's do it anyway. I have a package called timer and TMR. Ta TMR must recur. And uh, basically it lets you uh, specify a, a timer uh, and it uses a format that is, let's see if we have it over here, maybe. Um, I'm not sure now what I should be searching for. Ridiculous. Okay, yeah. So you can specify a format like 1M, which means one minute, or 50S, which means 50 seconds, 2H, which means two hours. And there is also an option to uh, input a W, so for example, 1W. And in that case, instead of setting a timer for one week, you get the answer, uh, the user error rather, timer made ridiculous. So again, that's a recursive uh, acronym uh, over here. You can see it, but that's uh, the kind of joke that we need to make uh, from time to time. So 
uh, back to uh, what I was uh, saying here uh, with regard to the modus uh, themes. There are uh, two uh, user facing changes that uh, you need to be aware of uh, at this point. The first is a new toggle, modus themes deuteranopia. Uh, deuteranopia is the name for red green color deficiency. So, of course, the themes uh, provide the support for this uh, use case. And uh, this toggle consolidates the various uh, styles that we had uh, before, consolidates and supersedes, so everything else is obsolete now, uh, all the styles we had before for a deuteranopria uh, friendly uh, presentation. Basically, it changes the red-green color coding to a red-blue color coding, which is uh, what you need uh, to uh, be able to differentiate colors in specific scenario like diffs or org to do and done keywords, the org habit graph in the agenda and uh, so on. Uh, so that's the one thing. I think it makes things much easier and more uh, straightforward. And uh, I expect it that it will be uh, straightforward for you to use, so not much to uh, say about it. Uh, the other change pertains to the Modus Themes Diffs customization option, which no longer supports a foreground-only style. Uh, for the last few versions, we had uh, supported such a style, but uh, I uh, have reached the conclusion that it is not up to the standard that I want uh, for the themes. It is not good enough. Even though the colors that were used were technically above the accessibility threshold that we uh, aim for, the 7 to 1 contrast ratio in relative luminance between two color, uh, two color values, sorry about that, even though uh, it meets that standard, I think it still is not uh, good enough. It, simply is not up to the same aesthetics as the rest of the theme and it imposes a constraints that I do not uh, like. Constraints that uh, spring from uh, the colors that have to be used and that's uh, not uh, nice. Uh, I won't go into the technicalities of what exactly those problems are and uh, bother you with those kind of details but it's just something for you to know. However, there is a section, a new section in the manual of the Modus themes. Of course, the manual of the Modus themes is comprehensive. It covers everything you could ever uh, ask for. Uh, in the manual, there is a new section with a specific code on how you can implement a foreground only style for diffs. So there is that, hopefully uh, you will understand uh, my uh, decision here. And if you think something uh, is missing, of course, uh, we can uh, rectify that before the release of version uh, 2.0. Uh, so speaking of aesthetics, uh, let me show you uh, one uh, case here, which is uh, the kind of thing that I don't really talk about but really informs the design uh, of the themes. So let's uh, go, for example, uh, I will show it to you right away. Let's make some whatever change uh, just so that we can go to Magit. So here is Magit and I want to uh, prepare um, a commit message. You know how this goes. So this is a test to check whether we will get a warning here. So you will notice uh, that uh, the text uh, is uh, yellow after a certain point. Uh, that is because uh, when you are writing a summary in Git commits, you are expected by convention to go up to 50 characters. So every character after the 50th column will be uh, colored with uh, a different style so as to warn you that you shouldn't be doing this. Same for the next line. The next line here should not exist, should not exist. It should be here. This is okay. So 
before I was using for this kind of uh, warning and this kind of error, uh, I was using a yellow background and a red background respectively. The problem, as reported by Damien Cassou, was that if you are using HL line mode, so if you are using this thing over here, if there is a background, it will override it. Let's see, maybe we can go back to the presentation and you can see here, you see that there is a green background over here. If I uh, move the HL line over it, it overrides the green background. So of course it is less obvious what the issue is, because if you are typing with HL line mode enabled, you will never see the warning. So I told Damien, let's make the warning a yellow color, but in order to ensure maximum contrast, maximum effect, let's also make the valid color over here blue. It was not blue before, it was cyan. And you may wonder why I made that suggestion. It is because uh, of color theory. I am aware of color theory and I know that with the display technology for our purposes over here, blue and yellow are complementary colors. Uh, and this pr practically means that uh, they are uh, good uh, when they are combined together because they are uh, opposites. So it's easy to tell one from the other. So this was the kind of thing that uh, I, uh, this is the kind of thing that I am doing, uh, but I don't really talk about uh, because it is very tricky and also it's the kind of implementation detail that doesn't really matter. What, what matters is that you get a theme that works, but still it's something for you to uh, be aware of. Uh, anyhow, the version uh, 2 will be available before the end of this year and I will also sync it with uh, upstream Emacs and then uh, it will go to all the relevant uh, package archives. Uh, as always, thanks to everyone who has contributed the code or ideas. Uh, the list of names is too long for me to include it here. There is, however, a section in the manual uh, of the modus themes, uh, which uh, is uh, called uh, Acknowledgements. And you can find uh, all the names over here from A to Z. So there is uh, that as well. Uh, and uh, here, as I said, I have the task list for what I am doing, but let's not bother with that. And let's uh, go to the final uh, point here, which is about uh, Emacs Conf 2021. It, this is the annual Emacs uh, conference uh, it, that took place last week, last uh, weekend. There were lots of interesting talks and you can uh, find them all by following uh, this link. And uh, if you follow this link, I am doing it now inside of EWW, uh, you will uh, find links uh, to all the presentations and you can always download uh, whatever material is relevant to that uh, presentation so uh, you can check for yourself. And there are lots of interesting talks over here over both uh, days of the event. I don't want to single out uh, anyone in particular because uh, there were I watched the whole thing and I really enjoyed it. So I don't want to just uh, mention someone but forget uh, some other person's uh, presentation. But it's something for you uh, to uh, spend uh, some time on. It's really worth it. Uh, for uh, an annual event, I am very happy that uh, I was able to participate in it. Uh, so yes, there is a, a presentation I made as well. Um, I'm not sure if I should publish it on my channel. I have asked the organizers about it. I think I can based on um, the license that is used, but I am not sure. So uh, just uh, in case you can check it from uh, this link uh, over there. There were some questions uh, regarding my presentation that I only noticed today. I was on the IRC chat, so I didn't check elsewhere, but I found out uh, this morning. So I thought I would answer them here very briefly, uh, just in case. Uh, so it was not my intention to ignore them. So apologies for that. 
So here we have the first question. Uh, in parentheses, unrelated, feel free not to answer. Is there an Emacs or GNU slash FSF group in Cyprus? I know it's a politically motivated country with a strong student base, so I am interested whether the Emacs circles and political circles have any overlap. And my answer to this is uh, I am not aware of any GNU or FSF related group here in Cyprus. Maybe it exists, but I live in the mountains, so I live far away from the urban uh, centers. Uh, the closest city from where I am is Limassol, Lemesos, and it is about uh, an hour away, 50 minutes to an hour away by car. So, uh, whereas the capital, Lefkosia or Nicosia, is maybe um, two and a half hours or something like that. So, really, I am uh, kind of in my own little bubble up here. Uh, when I was a university student, uh, more than 10 years ago here, uh, I did not notice any such overlap between uh, politics or politically interested uh, people uh, and uh, software freedom. I, I was not uh, ever made aware of such a, a, a nucleus of uh, people, even though I was actively involved in extracurricular activities, I was uh, actively involved in uh, the milieu of um, local activism, uh, but uh, I never heard about uh, GNU slash Linux, let alone Emacs. Uh, I only learned about those uh, later. I started getting into computers at around 2012 and switched to free software in uh, mid-2016. Of course, if there is any Cypriot uh, who uh, happens to uh, know me, please contact me and maybe we can set something up. I don't know uh, what are uh, the prospects of that, but uh, if we can, we can, uh, of course, give it a try. So that's the first uh, question. Second question, uh, what do you think is the most effective way to demonstrate the value of software freedom to non-technical people? For a person who can't program or doesn't want to learn, the freedom seems less immediate. And my answer to that is that I think the most effective way to let people uh, experience software freedom is for them to use uh, the software, for them to use the program, because that is exactly what you are doing. By using the program, you are already enjoying the freedom it gives you. It sure is less obvious because you are not starting something from scratch. You are not coding it into existence, so to speak. So that might give the impression that it, you do not own it. Uh, but it doesn't work that way because the whole point of software freedom and of freedom in general, but let's speak about software freedom here. And the reason we have uh, all those movements and all those communities, the Emacs community, the GNU uh, project, the FSF, the Linux kernel, and so on. The reason we have all those communities is exactly because uh, freedom is understood and experienced between people. There is an intersubjective aspect to it, an interpersonal aspect to it. There is no freedom in a vacuum. You don't exist in a vacuum. You are not a decontextualized presence. You always exist somewhere. You are always environed by people, by structure, by a certain structure, a certain environment. So, of course, when you are participating in an environment that makes freedom uh, possible, you are already enjoying uh, those benefits. And some practical benefits in that regard are the fact that when you are using the free software tool, you are not uh, afraid that some corporation will terminate your subscription to that program, for example, or that they will update their terms of service or that they will somehow violate your privacy and so on. You are uh, not afraid of any of that. 
exactly because the software is not meant to exer exert control over you. It is meant for you to use it and to use it uh, without any kind of impediments, without any kind of fetters. So that's just the very basic idea. I will um, elaborate on this notion of intersubjectivity uh, in a future uh, video, but hopefully you get uh, what I am about uh, to say here. Uh, and ma many great software is open source, says James. That, of course, is uh, true. Um, uh, lots of uh, things that we use and we take for granted are uh, open source or even uh, free software in the sense of uh, freedom and not in the sense of uh, cheap or uh, free of cost, costless. Uh, so that was question two. Uh, question three, uh, your quote, uh, Emacs makes emergent workflows possible, reminds me very much of the previous talk, Emacs as design pattern learning. Can you share or reflect how you go about making or designing your personal workflows? And uh, the answer to this, um, just to clarify for others uh, that uh, the previous talk, which is mentioned in this uh, question, is the one of Greta Getz. Uh, as I said, make sure you check the schedule of EmacsConf. Greta's uh, presentation uh, is definitely one you should uh, check out. There are also many others you should ch uh, check out again. I don't want to uh, mention uh, individual talks because I will uh, inevitably forget about uh, someone and that would be a pity. So to your point about uh, how do you go about the designing such a workflow, um, I like to use packages that have a clear scope. I think this is obvious also from uh, the videos I do, and I also like to have good documentation so that I can get into the package and understand what it, it is doing. But the essence is that the package has a clear scope, it is very specific in what it is doing, and it has good code. It follows uh, best practices when it comes to code. I don't want dirty hacks all over the place. I want things to be implemented uh, neatly, to be implemented in a way that allows for uh, extensibility. Uh, so when you have all those minimalist implementations, of course, uh, in accordance with the Unix philosophy, uh, you can compose them into larger uh, workflows. And an example of that is what I mentioned earlier with MCT, with the mini buffer and all that. You don't have to have a massive overarching uh, package that does everything uh, you can imagine. You just want something specific for completion, something specific for um, uh, the completion style, like orderless, something specific for uh, grep, something specific for some other task and then you can combine them together because they lend themselves to that kind of composability. Uh, this is uh, something that I have talked about before with regard to the Unix philosophy. I think uh, two live streams ago uh, was the topic of Emacs and the Unix philosophy where I uh, uh, elaborated on the notion that Emacs is consistent with the Emacs philosophy and I stand by this uh, position and I explain in uh, that presentation uh, how I um, justify uh, that opinion. And when I say Unix philosophy, I am specifically talking about the philosophy, so the mindset. I'm not talking about some historical artifact. I am not talking about Unix in 1980. That's a, a part of history, but the philosophy is not limited to the 80s. The philosophy is with us today. We can live in accordance with it. We can operate in accordance with it. So I don't want to think of Unix as some kind of a historical artifact. And of course, I also don't want to think of Unix as a dogma, as some kind of pseudo-religion that we can never 
criticize or that we should never deviate from. It is a philosophy and as a philosophy we have to approach it in a manner that is conducive to philosophy. So we need to be dubitative, we need to be inquisitive and we need to be skeptical in how we conduct ourselves. So that's the basic uh, idea and of course everything I covered in uh, EmacsConf 2021 in my presentation about um, the virtues of Emacs and how uh, it lends itself to uh, getting to know it and extend it and all uh, that stuff. Uh, finally, this uh, uh, topic that comes up, it was uh, in the EmacsConf presentation and um, it also in uh, David's uh, latest uh, live stream. So the idea of doing a video with David Wilson, also known as uh, the Sister Cr System Crafters channel. Uh, so yes, the short answer to that is that I am happy to do a video with uh, David. Uh, of course, we are now on the same time zone. I am in Southern Cyprus and David is in uh, Athens, Greece. So we are uh, in the Eastern European uh, time. So, of course, uh, if it happens, I would be uh, more than happy to participate. Of course, you don't need to spam David the whole time. When are you going to do it and what are you going to talk about? Uh, it will happen and uh, you will uh, see it. Um, of course, don't expect. I, I noticed this. There was this idea of a debate. Uh, don't expect that, of course. I also don't debate in the sense that politicians use that word because um, I'm not in the business of persuasive uh, speech. I don't think we need to convince anyone, especially because this is Emacs and Emacs is all about choice. So, of course, what people are using is none of my business. Whatever they want to use with Emacs, that's uh, for them to decide and that's the right thing. And uh, so, yes, that's it. One last point, one last point. I didn't write it here. I forgot about it, but now I remember it. And uh, that is um, this idea that comes up from time to time that the modus themes should be made the default uh, in Emacs, in upstream Emacs. Uh, this, uh, there is an issue about it in the um, in the issue tracker of uh, the modus themes. My answer to that, the short version of my answer to that is no. And not because I don't want it. Of course, I use the modus themes and uh, that's the only uh, pair of themes I, uh, I'm interested in. But I don't think it should be made the default because one, you want the default to be a pristine environment. So when you log in to, when you launch Emacs uh, hyphen capital Q, so this on the command line, Emacs Q. So when you launch this, you want to have a pristine environment you don't want to have a theme loaded because there may be a bug in the theme. So you don't want uh, to have uh, that polluting uh, an otherwise uh, pristine session. So that's the one thing. And the other thing is that themes are a very personal choice. So I don't want uh, Emacs to impose uh, its um, own uh, ideas on uh, users. Uh, there are many people who use Emacs out of the box without any theme and maybe they will make some tweaks here and there to some faces, but generally they don't use a theme. So, of course, we don't want those people to go into the trouble of removing the theme. We, we want this to be an opt-in process. So, again, I am happy if it happens, but I don't want it to happen. I want uh, campaign for it to happen. I won't uh, go on Emacs Devel and uh, ask for it. So that's about it, folks. So this was the status update on what I have been uh, doing lately uh, with uh, Emacs. There will be, uh, maybe I will do another video uh, before the end of the month uh, on some more theoretical slash philosophical issues with Emacs. Uh, but uh, this is all for now. Uh, as I said, the text of this presentation, you can find the link uh, in uh, the chat over here. And now we can uh, check the chat. 
maybe if I move this, maybe, okay, okay, so I can move this here, maybe, maybe you see what I am seeing right now, let me see, uh, let me see if it will move very quickly, just, okay, so it moves, okay, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to know, uh, so let's see what we have here, I think we left at this uh, point, uh, somewhere here it was, yes. Uh, so yes, hello from Philippines, says uh, Vincent. Uh, hello, Vincent. Uh, and am I too late? Um, it doesn't matter if you are too late, because this is being recorded, so of course uh, you can uh, re-watch it. And even if you don't want to watch it, you can just check the text of the presentation. Uh, many, uh, okay, we covered that. Uh, Shix says, thanks for adding a new word to my vocabulary, fecund. Yeah, I wrote that word, but I actually didn't um, read from the text. Uh, let's see, where do we have it? Uh, so yes, uh, this is about the Unix philosophy that I consider interesting and fecund, so fruitful or um, very inspiring if you want to uh, not take it uh, literally. So every time I read any of your presentations, I learn a new word. Okay, that's good to know. And uh, I hope uh, that's uh, helpful. Uh, generally, when I write, I don't use um, a jargon. So maybe I will use some word that it's, it is not so common, like fecund, for example. But I don't use jargon. I don't use... Uh, technicalities or if I do I always explain what I mean and if I don't that's a mistake uh, so hopefully you will always understand what I am trying to say uh, let's see uh, Tamash says uh, even main authors of Unix acknowledged issues with it that's why they made plan 9 exactly uh, a very good uh, point indeed uh, nothing to add to that uh, uh, Krishna says, Prot, can I get your suggestions on note-taking? I know that you were a humanities student yourself, and I like you love to use Emacs, so how do I merge those two together to become an efficient student? Um, my answer to this may be a bit, uh, here is another word in case you don't know, iconoclastic, a, a bit unorthodox. Uh, and that is that you don't start by searching for the right tools. You start by searching for the right method. And then you find the tools that uh, are consistent with that method. Uh, in my uh, channel, you will uh, the first live stream I did was uh, on the... Um, let's, uh, let's go to uh, my website's uh, source code. Um, let's see, and you will see I have it over here. On the 31st of August, I did a video about the notion of Emacs as a second brain and the idea of mindfulness. So nominally, this is about note taking, but of course, uh, these are general uh, ideas. You can uh, apply them uh, elsewhere. Of course, you can use Emacs as a second brain and you can use it to become an efficient student. But again, Emacs is not magic. So you must have a method for how to use uh, Emacs. And uh, this is what uh, the presentation uh, is about. You can find the text of the presentation. There is also a, a video uh, embedded there so you can uh, find it either on my website or on my uh, uh, channel my YouTube uh, channel. Um, in short, uh, if you want to just take notes, you can do it with plain org. You don't need any extension for that. There is, of course, org roam. Everybody seems to be using org roam these days. And from what I can gather, it is an absolutely excellent uh, tool. Uh, one of those killer apps, as we say. So maybe you will want to check uh, org roam as well. Again, though, I think the method comes first and then uh, you find the tools to make that method happen. And of course, one other thing, don't uh, fall into the trap of trying to make the perfect workflow in abstract. 
you have to start with something and you will see uh, over time through trial and error what works and what doesn't so you you can do this iteratively you don't have to do it all at once it will not happen all at once because you lack foresight you lack uh, an understanding of how everything works together whereas through experience through trial and error you will see uh, what kind of tool uh, is required for a specific uh, workflow a specific uh, task but yes generally emacs org or Chrome, those sorts of things are uh, good for note taking and for uh, doing things efficiently. Uh, uh, Tamas says, uh, every time you say this is Emacs, it reminds me of the phrase, this is Sparta. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, the, um, the movie, the 300, this is uh, Sparta. It's, um, of course, you know, this is not a historically accurate movie, of course, but it is fun uh, in its own uh, way, in its own hyperbolic uh, way. Uh, it is uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, so, yeah, of, of course, I also have the beard. So, of course, I could uh, do my own impression of this is Sparta, <laughs> that, that sort of thing. Let's not try it now. Let's not. Uh, try to um, enact um, the scene uh, right uh, here and now. Uh, let's uh, go back to where we were. Sorry. Keep this here. Uh, so what we have, where are we? Mm. Uh, okay, so this is a Sparta. Uh, there is a, a question here, what is plan 9? But I think I saw a reply further below. And yes, that's the sort of thing that you have to uh, search online for. It's, um, it's a good idea to uh, have a sense of um, the history of technology. I think generally, whatever field you are in, whether you are an economist, a physicist, a political scientist, a lay person, whatever you are in, it's always a good idea to have a sense of the history of your interests because you will uh, always learn uh, something that uh, previous generations knew or previous generations had to cope with and uh, that might help you gain an, uh, a different perspective on things. It's always a good idea to know um, a bit of history. Of course, this also applies to human history, uh, but also to more specific types of history. Uh, let's see. Um, looking forward to watching you prod with uh, System Crafters. Uh, yes, as I said, it will eventually happen. But of course, it's a matter of um, coordinating with David and uh, seeing when it happens. But again, you don't need to uh, spam David uh, the whole time or me for that matter. Uh, so yeah, just it will happen and we'll see when it happens. Uh, Edge Crusher says Plan 9 is a research operating system ba made by the Unix guys from Bell Labs. And again, also Tamas says check out Plan 9 from Bell Labs on Wikipedia and also read catv.org to learn more about the history. And uh, Tamas says plus one for a joint David and Prot episode. Dmitri, hello, Dima, hello, how are you doing? Nice to see you here. Are we going to see an anime theme for Emacs with cat girls anytime soon? <laughs> I don't know, but what I do know about uh, anime themed uh, technology is window managers. I mean, every time you search for window manager configuration, you always get either neon lights or some anime related uh, wallpaper so there is uh, that but i haven't seen anything um, emacs specific when it comes to anime when it comes to cuts i don't know either uh, but i wouldn't be surprised there is um, a package called parrot it's not about cuts or anime but it's still a fun little thing uh, yeah uh, a minor mode for displaying party parrot in the mode line and rotating words. Uh, I will let you check this out. It's uh, kind of funny. 
but uh, you can always uh, learn about um, documentation about the package control H and capital P and then you type in the package that you want and you get information about it. so yes uh, next next point uh, Peya says hey prod if uh, uh, if it's not on your long term 10 year plan to do list yet a video on improving Emacs startup and performance for general populace would be very helpful. Uh, by general populace, I mean like myself, people who don't do much development but use lots of packages to make Emacs uh, nicer for org mode, email, news, etc. Um, and uh, there is one answer to this, so I will uh, read the answer before I comment as well. Uh, and the answer is, have you tried using Emacs as a daemon process that starts when you boot your computer? It adds to boot time, but once your system is booted, starting Emacs is as fast as opening a new frame. And yes, I think this is the easiest approach. Of course, you start Emacs in uh, daemon mode and then you just spawn a client. Uh, you just spawn a frame wherever you want and it... Uh, pops up uh, instantaneously basically how otherwise uh, you will have to implement all sorts of techniques it's no longer easy it's an involved process for example you will have to use um, the use package uh, macro and you will have to defer packages uh, from loading at startup you will want to load them uh, when they are required. So uh, you have to uh, make configurations there. Um, Doom Emacs, I think, uh, popularized the idea and implemented it actually, the idea of uh, changing the threshold of the garbage collector. I, I am not, an, uh, I don't have an intimate understanding of what a garbage collector is when it comes to programming, but my uh, lay person's um, a conception of it is that basically uh, you want to uh, give Emacs more time before it goes into the process of trying to check if something is no longer needed. So you don't want to Emacs, you don't want Emacs to check for unnecessary stuff all the time because that uh, that actually consumes resources. You want to increase that uh, cycle. Uh, as it were. Again, that is something that you have to implement on your own, so it takes a bit more uh, time and effort. Otherwise, daemon mode is uh, great. Of course, you can also use Doom Emacs. There is nothing wrong with using a framework uh, like uh, Doom Emacs. Uh, there are probably thousands of users, and I, must, I may say that they are having a good time. So if you want to go down that path, of course, that's uh, perfectly fine. It still is Emacs. You can still do whatever you are doing with Emacs. My Emacs configuration has been built uh, from scratch since 2019, the, sun, uh, the summer of 2019. When I switched to Emacs, I have been using this uh, configuration. Of course, I have made uh, changes to it over time, but it's the same uh, one from uh, day one. Uh, and I don't really care about um, startup times myself because uh, I will um, uh, start the computer, I will launch Emacs and then go get some uh, water or whatever. And by the time I am back, Emacs will be there waiting for me uh, to get some uh, work done. So I don't really care if it took one second or five seconds or however long it takes. I have no idea how long it takes to start up actually. So there is that. Uh, let's see, uh, System Crafters. So David Wilson says, agreed 100%, things need to grow organically. And though the real needs uh, of the workflow, yes, and through the real needs of the workflow, exactly. So always uh, try to um, uh, use something that works and don't worry about the ideal workflow. There is no such thing as an ideal workflow. If something is good, it is better than nothing. That is the kind of mindset that you need to have. And again, the mindset of perfecting it over time. Um, 
So Gnu Ninja says, semi-retired, I don't worry about work, just the flow. <laughs> yeah, so it's no longer the workflow, it's the flow. That's a, a, a nice one. Uh, so uh, you have tried the daemon and you say, but I've noticed do Mimax starts within three seconds, even on my crappy machine. Something must give. Yeah, um, do Mimax has all those optimizations. So the garbage collector and everything related to use package optimizations. So do Mimax is a legitimate choice if that's what you need. There's a list of stuff from Henrik. Uh, Henrik Listener, for in case you don't know, is the maintainer and the developer of Doom Emacs. Uh, so Henrik somewhere on Reddit to take inspiration from, but proper, Prot probably has a feather or two up the sleeves I'm interested in. So yes, it's what I already covered. I don't have anything in my configuration. Um, because of uh, the fact that I don't really need it. But, of course, uh, improvements uh, in, when it comes to performance are always uh, welcome. Um, this thing always scrolls erratically and I can never predict where it will uh, land. Uh, so, uh, Dinkonin says, uh, hello, by the way. Uh, Prot, what are some upcoming features and developments in Emacs 28 and 29 that you are excited about. So the first thing before I answer this, in case you don't know, when you are in Emacs, if you press Control H and the letter N, you will go to the news, so the news buffer for the current release. And this will give you an overview of what has changed and you can read it from start to finish. So that's always a good idea to do when you uh, um, uh, boot up uh, into a new Emacs version to go through the news file and uh, see what is there for you to check. Uh, for me in particular, uh, Emacs 28, the major feature of Emacs 28 is native compilation. So uh, I have been using that, uh, of course. So that's uh, great to have. Um, the other great feature for me specifically in Emacs 28 is the one column view in the completions buffer, which uh, has enabled uh, MCT, the package I talked about before. So this is the one column view. Um, uh, the other things over here, the annotations are from the marginalia uh, package. These are optional, of course. Uh, so that's the one column view from uh, Emacs uh, 28. Uh, I'm trying to think of other things in Emacs 28 specifically, but um, I am a bit fuzzy right now of what is in Emacs 28 and what is in Emacs 29. Of course, in Emacs 28, you also have the modus themes built into Emacs. So there is that uh, as well. Uh, uh, of course, that's not a major uh, issue, but still uh, something to keep in mind. For Emacs 29, there is a new feature, which uh, a new set of uh, commands, basically, which let you uh, input emoji. I, I have not used them extensively, so I'm not sure which one I need, and I also need to change the key bindings, but it is Control X, the number eight, and then E, that is the prefix. So that's a bit too long if you want to uh, make any use of emoji. But uh, basically, we have all those commands, emoji list, emoji recent, emoji describe, emoji search, and uh, emoji insert. Uh, so let's uh, go and uh, use emoji insert. And you have a buffer here. It's, it's a nice interface. This uses the, the transient uh, interface that you are familiar with from Magit. Uh, so let's say that I want smileys. And I want, uh, I don't know, uh, I want a monkey face. So I want uh, C. So you see, I have inputted the monkey face uh, right there. So that's a nice uh, feature to have. There are uh, other commands as well. Let's do this with search, if I search for monkey. So you see, we get that as well. So you can do it that way. 
Uh, I haven't used those commands extensively, but I think it's great to have that sort of functionality uh, built into Emacs. Emojis these days are everywhere, so we might as well uh, have them in uh, Emacs as well. Uh, there are other things in Emacs 29, uh, but I'm not sure right now what is uh, a killer feature, so to speak, or something uh, that is worth uh, noting at this stage. But always check the news file. If you are building Emacs from uh, Git, uh, straight from uh, the source code, let's go to Emacs uh, Git, you can always check the news over there. So you can always check all the news. You can always find everything in the source code. The one named news, just news without a number, is for the current version for uh, master. Uh, otherwise, you have uh, the news for all the versions of Emacs. So you can go there and check those uh, as well. And if you are, of course, pulling from Git, you can always check for changes in the news file and always have an idea of what is happening uh, in uh, Emacs development. So one way to check for changes in the news file is to visit the file and do Control X V and the letter L. Control X V is the prefix for the built-in version control framework uh, of Emacs. And when you do that, you will get uh, a log of commits. And when you are here, you can just, just press the letter D to uh, check the uh, diff, the corresponding diff for the commit at point. So uh, when there is something over there, you can check it out and you can always find something and you see how it goes. No need to belabor the point, you get the idea. Uh, so that's it for 28 and 29, uh, very briefly. Uh, how much time does normal Emacs take? To, oh, so that's about, yeah, the startup times. Uh, let's move to the next one. Games on Emacs. DT made a video on it. It was funny. Uh, I noticed the video, but I didn't uh, check it yet. I have downloaded it uh, and I plan to watch it uh, maybe this weekend or the next. I'm not sure, uh, but I am curious to see what DT uh, has to say. DT is DistroTube, of course. Uh, Derek uh, Taylor, I think that's uh, the name of um, DistroTube. Uh, so yes, uh, Emacs, of course, uh, has games uh, built in, uh, but I think the games that are built into Emacs uh, have a didactic value in the sense that you can uh, check the code and be inspired to do something uh, about them, uh, to maybe write your own little game with Emacs Lisp, but of course, uh, it's uh, something uh, mostly for entertainment uh, purposes. Uh, that's uh, Edge Crusher says that's another guy to do a collab video with DistroTube. Uh, yeah, sure. Again, I am open to doing uh, videos with uh, people who are uh, active in this uh, milieu. I would be very happy to do a video with uh, Derek. No problem there. The issue, however, is that David is the um, Derek is in the United States, and th there is a difference of uh, at least six to eight hours, or maybe more, uh, between the, our time zones. So it will be a bit more tricky to find uh, the time for it. But yes, in principle, I am not against the idea. Uh, Tim says, uh, let's see, sorry, because this thing again scrolls a bit weirdly. Uh, on an anime related note, there is also Neon mode. Yes. Uh, ah, yes, Neon mode. It's that um, cut, right? There is a Neon mode, so like this. Uh, so, uh, yes. Uh, so, yes, there is um, a package called Neon mode. And I think this uh, shows you the position where you are on the file instead of being a percentage of a file, it shows you a progress bar with an anime cut. So maybe it's what um, uh, it's what uh, Dimitri was uh, looking for. Uh, so what? Where are we? So uh, startup again here. Thirty seconds uh, on my hand rolled uh, config. That was why I moved to Doom in the first place, but with Doom I get a constant feeling of dealing with layers that I don't fully understand. Um, okay, 
but yes, it's exactly what we have already covered with um, startup times. It's you have to optimize use package. You have to optimize the garbage uh, the garbage collector, or you have to run uh, the daemon uh, process. Uh, I, and as I said, I really don't mind um, a, a cost in a startup time. I really don't care about it. Because uh, the other thing, maybe it, it wasn't obvious. I only start Emacs once. So when I open the computer, when I switch it on, I launch Emacs and will use it for as long as the computer is open. And when I leave Emacs, I also uh, switch off the computer. So there is that. Uh, recommended reading for an introduction to Greek philosophy as well as recommended resources. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure to be honest because uh, I never uh, read any kind of uh, introduction myself. I think the best way to start with philosophy is to read philosophers because um, not, to, not to imply that uh, those who write about the original sources have nothing to say, but I think that um, academics uh, have a, a different audience in mind sometimes. So they may be technical, they may be combining uh, information from one source with another source to make a bigger point. So that kind of thing for a newcomer, I think, may uh, be confusing because you are lacking context. So, for example, if you want an introduction to philosophy, a good idea is to start with uh, Platon, Plato, uh, or Aristotle even. Aristotle, uh, of course, has covered uh, a very broad range of uh, topics, but uh, Aristotle's uh, style, Aristotle's lucidity and clarity are something that is not that easy to find. So, of course, even if you are a beginner, um, you can uh, learn something from those. I think, however, uh, Plato is a, a good place uh, to start. Not all dialogues. Some of di some of uh, Plato's dialogues are very difficult. For example, uh, Parmenides and Theaetitos. Uh, those are among the most uh, difficult ones. But there are others which are more uh, approachable, uh, such as uh, Crito or the the republic is also more approachable there are uh, you will uh, start with plato and uh, you will uh, find something there i think that's the best uh, way to start with philosophy with greek philosophy in particular uh, so someone says i'm spartacus <laughs> uh, so what do we have again about uh, slow startup times uh, the same discussion over there uh, Tim adds to this discussion, Emacs is a bit slow and you want to check out whether adjusting the uh, GC threshold would help. Uh, you can set the variable garbage collection messages to true. Uh, straight L for the win, says Tamas. Uh, you can still use use package style expression in your own config, even if straight.el manages the package downloads. Yes, yes, of course, uh, straight again is an excellent uh, package in that regard. What do you use for playing video files? Ask uh, Tamas. Uh, I use MPV on uh, the command line. Uh, so just MPV and then the link to the video and it works. If I am inside of Elpid, I have a key binding. So I just press the key and it launches uh, MPV right away with the uh, link to the file. Or I may enqueue those links and uh, add them to a bongo playlist buffer and play them uh, from there again with MPV as a back end. Uh, so it's MPV and the YouTube DL. So they are meant to uh, work together. Uh, Ihor Radchenko says, um, so hello Ihor. Uh, have you thought about making videos in a conference uh, format? Instead of streams like in YouTube, use BBB or similar to allow live voice communication and easy collaboration. Uh, I'm not sure what BBB is. Is it that uh, program that was used in uh, EmacsConf? So maybe that's the one, big blue button, something like that. Um, it would be interesting. I'm not against the idea. Uh, I uh, You must also understand that I have 
little experience with um, live streaming and with video editing and so on. I never edit my videos, for example. So I, if you ask me how you edit videos, I have no idea. Uh, I also have only done four live streams, I think. This is the fourth one. So again, I don't know uh, much about how things are supposed to be configured behind the scenes and how to make everything uh, uh, nice uh, for the purposes of the presentation. But of course, um, doing something in a conference uh, format would be very interesting, especially uh, because we can bring uh, more uh, perspectives into the discussion and that would be uh, nice to have. Uh, which dialect of the English language do you use? Here in India, we use the British one. Uh, I also write in British English, but of course my accent is not uh, British. But for example, when I type color, it is OU, so color. Uh, so I type it like that. And when I uh, say words like rationalize, it is with an ISE at the end instead of a Z. Uh, and that sort of thing, of a Z and that sort of uh, thing. Uh, of course, uh, you may know that Cyprus was a British colony as well. And uh, what you may not know is that um, we still have two sovereign military bases uh, in Cyprus, two sovereign military uh, bases of Britain in Cyprus. So those are, are considered British soil. So it's not Cyprus. So we have uh, two of them. But that's another discussion. Uh, uh, so Nian mode and party parrot will be a nice touch for my Emacs config. Thank you. You are welcome. Uh, so where do we have? Uh, I like uh, MPV, which is uh, a thin GUI uh, over M player, but I am biased because I know the M player team. I even had a trip around Europe with M players uh, RP and convinced him to climb the Olympus with me. Okay, that's uh, great. That's uh, good to know. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so thanks, uh, Krishna says, thanks, Prod, for the philosophy recommendation. Uh, you are welcome. Um, of course, not related to your original question about Greek philosophy, but um, over the last few months, I have been writing. Let's go to my website for a second. Um, I don't mean to say that I am on the same level as Plato or Aristotle, nothing like that. Of course, that would be ridiculous. But I have been writing in a style like Plato of dialogues. Uh, so you will find all those um, um, essays that uh, are in the format of why I will never call you, why I won't join your club, uh, why I learned to let go and so on and so forth. So you can uh, check those. And uh, you will uh, see uh, that um, it's easy to follow. You will see that philosophy is not something super technical, that you need to be an expert in all sorts of books before you can even begin to understand it. Philosophy is uh, for everyone, in my opinion. Uh, you just need to pay attention. Uh, that's the basic thing, but this applies to everything that includes a level of sophistication. When you uh, configure Emacs, for example, you need to pay attention. When uh, you are uh, studying, when you are reading a book, you need to pay attention. So just some basic uh, stuff. Otherwise, there is nothing about philosophy that should keep you away from it. And uh, if I may add this one, if there is a philosopher that actively hampers your efforts uh, to approach uh, philosophy, uh, that philosopher may uh, be a bad influence. Uh, and uh, you will know what I mean uh, once you start uh, reading philosophy. Sorry uh, to be a bit cryptic uh, on this. Uh, so, yeah, let's um, see where we are. Uh, so, yes, it's the big blue button. Uh, I have no experience with it. I will need to uh, check it. But yes, in principle, I like the idea of a conference uh, style um, uh, video. Uh, 
let's see what we have. So there is a present, uh, there is a recommendation here, uh, Krishna also, uh, Philosophy for Beginners by Richard Osborne, in case you want to take a look. Um, do you use any plugins with MPV? Uh, no, and uh, I had no idea that uh, such plugins existed, uh, to be honest. Uh, maybe you mean some GUI uh, over MPV, like what GNOME has or something like that, or is it something uh, different? Uh, but no, I don't use any plugin, not that I am aware of at least. And uh, I am on Arch Linux, so I uh, don't think that uh, it would install such a thing uh, on its own. That would be uh, out of style. Uh, I just saw today that there is a YouTube DLP, which is a YouTube DL fork and extend it with nice features like downloading the transcriptions or splitting up videos into chapters. I also noticed that uh, package, but I have not checked it yet. And I want to check it because also YouTube DL has been giving me some problems lately. Uh, I try to watch uh, a video and it always uh, goes into a buffering. So it always tells me that uh, we cannot load this now, so you have to wait. And um, when I want to watch a video, I have to pause it and wait for it to load, you know, as if I have some dial-up connection. Uh, but yes, I will check uh, this um, fork of YouTube DL uh, for sure. Uh, yes, it's Z, not Z, no arguments allowed. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we have to be very um, uh, strict about uh, this. <laughs> Uh, personally, I am very lax when it comes to language in general. Uh, I'm, I'm not the kind of person uh, who will insist on stylistic aspects of language. I think language is a medium of communication. And for as long as you understand what, what I am trying to say, even if I make the occasional error, you should ignore that error and just stick to the point. And the point is what I am saying and not the style in which I am saying it. And that is uh, in general. In Greece, for example, we have, you know, languages, of course, are kind of uh, living organisms, so to speak, because they uh, develop over time, over the centuries. Uh, so in Greece, we have ancient Greek, of course, which is no longer an active language, but its influences are still felt uh, to this day. We use all sorts of expressions, uh, all sorts of uh, styles from ancient uh, Greek. Then we have um, uh, medieval Greek. We have uh, Greek uh, from uh, a few decades ago and different styles. So when you write in Greek, if you have some professor insisting on writing proper Greek, they will consider it an error if you use an ancient Greek style, even though Greek speakers will understand what you are saying. So I tell those professors to go and sod off and instead I will use whatever style I want. Uh, so the point is to uh, communicate with people and uh, if you can do that, then uh, stylistic points are of no significance, to me at least. Uh, so what do we have here? Uh, what monospaced uh, font uh, do you use uh, on your Emacs? So this one is, um, um, how do we call it? A modified version of Hack. Uh, so I have uh, this repo, it's um, upstream uh, on uh, GitLab. And uh, so uh, I explain in the readme what kind of uh, changes I have made. Uh, so maybe we can do, um, uh, we can zoom in, so not so much. Maybe we can zoom in a bit so you can uh, see some of the differences. So you can see, for example, the zero. If you know hack, how it is designed. The zero has a, a, a mid dot, which is very elongated. So it's kind of like a, a block instead of a dot. So I don't like that. And I am using the slash zero instead. Uh, the number one in hack has a hook at the top, whereas mine is almost flat at the top. So I went to the git history of hack before version uh, 3 and I found the glyph that I was interested in 
I even went back to history uh, in Hack, back to version 1.3, so that was ages ago, and I found an alternative to the letter A because I uh, was noticing something at a very small scale and I needed a different version of A. So you can understand that this is a bit of uh, insanity, but I did that uh, and I am happy with the results. So this is Hack that I am using now. Another uh, great font that I am using, again, a modified version of it is uh, Iosefka and I am using uh, my own uh, modifications of it. So this one you can see again, it's, uh, uh, let's see, Iosefka Comfy. So again, this is uh, in uh, my uh, GitLab, uh, you can find it on uh, over there. Uh, and uh, I explain here, actually I don't explain, I realize now that I don't explain here uh, what the changes are and the reason for that is because I provide the, the build file and this one has every uh, character that is being modified. So these are codes over here and uh, in the comment you get uh, what kind of uh, glyph corresponds to this uh, code. So I have everything here in those build plans. I also change the proportions of Iosefka. Again, I am crazy, so I have to do what crazy people do. Uh, and uh, But yeah, that's uh, another good uh, option. Uh, I did not like the out-of-the-box uh, Iosefka that much, the style, so I wanted to uh, tweak it a bit, so I did just that. But right now I am using a hack and the reason that I am using a hack is because this is not the actual um, size that I am working in. The actual size is this one, which is 0 .9, uh, 9 points. So uh, I am using uh, this uh, style and of course this, this makes it very easy when you are splitting uh, Emacs in two or three windows and I am working with this kind of uh, font uh, size. But for the purposes of uh, the video, uh, I always uh, default to a larger point uh, size. So there is that. Uh, Arch Linux uh, or uh, Parabola uh, Arch, Arch Linux. Uh, I never tried Parabola. Uh, I would like to do it at some point, but um, because uh, I am kind of um, cautious when it comes to um, GNU slash Linux distributions. If something works, I don't really go around searching for uh, alternatives. So the two distros that I have used are Debian and Arch uh, Linux. Uh, so um, I have been this build, uh, I have been on uh, Arch uh, for, um, I forget how long now, but yeah, it's between Debian and uh, Arch. Uh, that's it. Uh, so Comic Mono. <laughs> Uh, Comic Mono, I am not aware of it, honestly. Uh, and uh, Tamas adds that it is surprisingly good. So I will check that. Um, uh, so Ikor, uh, also a comment on uh, Greek uh, philosophy. So uh, from my experience, it is easier to learn philosophy starting from history of philosophy, apart from famous Greek philosophers. Yes, that's, uh, that's uh, of course great. You, from the history of philosophy, you can get an idea of what the general themes are and what kind of um, topics people are interested in. So, of course, that's good to have. And generally, what I mentioned earlier, knowing history is always good no matter what you are doing because you will get an, uh, a different perspective on the subject matter. Uh, for people who like good Unicode support, Kurinto has good support for various character sets. Again, I am not aware of this. I will check it out. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, again, Ihor adds to the previous point, an important part of common philosophical knowledge is religion. Major world religions also introduce important philosophical schools. Christian, Tao, Muslim, Confucius, etc. That is, of course, uh, true. Uh, all religions have a philosophical component uh, to them. Of course, religions are not limited to philosophy because uh, religions are also about the community aspect uh, of religion. There is also the theological aspect. 
but even if you ignore the, the, the theology of each individual religion, there is the community aspect, kind of what people are doing day to day uh, in their uh, community and how religion helps them uh, come uh, together and have something in common. Uh, and of course, you should name, uh, uh, you should add uh, Buddhism to that as well. And I would also add, um, even though it is uh, not a um, religion with many followers, I would even include the ancient Greek uh, religion. So the ancient Greek polytheism, of course, that too had uh, philosophical underpinnings. But again, this is true for all religions. Uh, personally, I am uh, not uh, religious. I, I don't subscribe to a specific religion, but of course, I also don't dismiss religion uh, outright. I don't dismiss religiosity. And also, I am interested to read what they have to say. I am interested in the substance of what they have to say. Uh, also, do not forget philosophical schools outside Europe. And that's a very important point, actually. Uh, no, because uh, at least in Europe, at least from what I know, we tend to have, uh, even in uh, modern times with the European Union and its uh, so-called European values, we tend to have a Eurocentric understanding of the world. Kind of like we Europeans, it is wrong, of course, but the idea is that we Europeans basically invented this, that or the other. And of course, that's the only thing that matters and everyone should follow that uh, paradigm. I don't share that view. Uh, what I am learning through my studies of um, reading other schools of philosophy and through my own thinking, my own writings on philosophy, is that for as long as there is an underlying reality over there, people, regardless of their background, will inevitably tread um, the same paths. They will inevitably touch on the same thing. We are approaching it from different angles, from a different cultural uh, viewpoint, but ultimately we are discussing, we are examining the same kind of uh, things. So, of course, there is always a lot to learn. For example, uh, the, the, last, um, the last one I published uh, maybe we can go, I have it, or did I delete? Okay, I deleted it. Uh, the last one uh, I published, uh, the last uh, presentation, the last essay rather, why it is not your fault. And this is about nullifying inapplicable thoughts and avoiding hubris. And I explain what I mean uh, in this uh, essay. Um, someone sent me an email and uh, said that they enjoyed it and also remarked, uh, the similarities with their own tradition. I don't want to share details right now, uh, but basically remarked how uh, their own tradition and Eastern tradition uh, also had similar uh, concepts. And um, I said that this is to be expected. And I am happy to also learn uh, what that tradition uh, has uh, to say, exactly because I am not interested in kind of we against them. That makes no sense uh, in philosophy, of course. That makes no sense in many places, but especially in philosophy, we don't uh, want to uh, promote Greek philosophy or European philosophy. We want philosophy, just that. We want the truth. And because we want the truth, we will accept whoever uh, shows us the way uh, to it, whoever helps us approximate the truth whoever helps us escape from falsehoods that we entertain. So just a general remark uh, there. Uh, Fantaske uh, is uh, what uh, Tamás is using la uh, lately. That's uh, Fantaske sans mono, right? That's a good font. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, my Iosefka Confi uh, has some uh, stylistic uh, similarity with um, uh, Fantaske sans mono. Of course, it's still Yosefka. If anyone is interested in Islam, uh, I highly recommend reading the two books by Hanef James Oliver, Sacred Freedom and the Wahhabi Myth, both freely available on the web. And again, uh, reading from a religion that is not your own, I think 
that is a good idea it is always a good idea to approach things with an open mind and always um, go into it without predispositions without saying oh let me read this in order to find what the fault is don't be like that read it with an open mind maybe you will learn something maybe you won't uh, if you have the time and you want to do it it's something uh, good to try it's a good habit i think if anything um, uh, Dimitri says it looks like it takes a lot of dedication to do font customization at such a level almost as a test of one's stubbornness or ability to systematically acquire knowledge of course I think it's more uh, stubbornness uh, but if we want to give it a positive spin we will say it is the latter about acquiring knowledge but in this case it was um, stubbornness in the sense that um, I generally like those two fonts. I generally like Hack and I generally like Iosefka. But there is always some detail that I keep observing. I keep noticing it. I cannot uh, get my uh, attention away from it. And that's actually detrimental to doing work. Of course, Ima, if I am typing, I forget about it. But as soon as I am idle, like now, as soon as I am just uh, looking at the screen like now if something is out of the ordinary it annoys me so i have to make sure uh, it works the way i want and actually that's one of the reasons why i developed the themes for emacs the first thing i did when i switched to emacs was to learn how to write my own theme and to start with that because i am very specific about the colors that i want exactly so that i don't get distracted uh, so, uh, so Ihor adds here, uh, ah, yeah, that's the recommendation about the two books, Sacred Freedom and the Wahhabi Myth. And uh, Ihor says, thanks, I have recently got interested in uh, Islam. So, uh, once you start looking into its philosophy, culture and religion, the common Western attitude to uh, Muslims starts to look ridiculous. Uh, I, I think... Um, this is true for this will be true for this case of course i agree with ihor here but i think uh, it is true for all things where we have a, a stereotype a predisposition and the moment you expose yourself to the actuality of things you realize how ridiculous how out of date how out of uh, touch the stereotype is this is not to say that uh, you will never find anything to disagree with or that uh, you will read this and it will be the single source of truth. That's not the mindset you should have. The idea is exactly to not judge without knowing. Don't be irresponsible. Don't be opinionated about something you do not really know. Be honest about yourself and say to yourself, look, I really don't know, so I will remain quiet. If I know, then I can be loud, then I can be opinionated, then I can be vociferous. But if you don't know, you don't have to be any of that. You just have to say that uh, you don't know. And once you learn, you can revisit the topic. Um, many problems in our world would have uh, not existed had we uh, uh, adopted such an attitude uh, collectively because we would then show real tolerance whereas now we have tolerance as kind of a tokenistic, tokenistic uh, issue everyone is about uh, tolerance and uh, diversity and all that but I don't think they um, live by that um, exhortation I don't think they live in accordance with those precepts i think they just say it because it sounds good it's it it gives you political or social points or whatever but uh, tolerance and diversity are very um, uh, profound uh, themes are very profound issues so it's not to be taken lightly just that um <laughs> uh, actually the first book the, of those two deals with that very topping the western attitude towards islam uh, so yes uh, you can check the books uh, online 
Uh, Tamás says customizing your forms is one way of exercising your freedom. Yes, of course, that's a, a big part of uh, software freedom uh, that you can uh, take the source code and uh, do something else with it that the maintainer, the developer did not foresee or did not provide for. Uh, Math Alphabet says recently I am reading slowly about stoicism. It has many ideas found elsewhere, like Buddhism. Uh, I think that's true. I also uh, see the overlap. Uh, there is also another school of thought uh, in ancient Greece before Stoicism, because Stoicism starts with the uh, Zeno of Kitium. Kitium is an ancient city uh, in uh, Cyprus, modern day Larnaca. Uh, and uh, Stoicism starts with uh, Zeno. Uh, but uh, there is another school which is older, which is, um, which is parallel rather uh, to Stoicism, which is called, um, uh, his historians rather called it Pyrrhonism, or later thinkers called it Pyrrhonism. So there was this philosopher called Pyrrho, Pyrrhos is then the word in uh, Greek. Let's, um, let's go to a scratch brother. So the name of the uh, ancient philosopher is Pyrrho. In Greek, it would be pronounced with an S at the end, Pyrrhos. Uh, I'm not sure where um, from, Pyrrhos of Elea. No, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm conflating uh, the name with someone else. There is Pyrrho, and for that, the school is known as Pyrrhonism. Uh, and this is a school of ancient skepticism and uh, i disagree with pyrrhonism i have written about it uh, but uh, pyrrhos uh, uh, was the teacher of another philosopher called enisidimus i think uh, enisidimus i think that's how it's written um, and enisidimus wrote about the 10 modes of skepticism this is 10 ways uh, by which we may reason about things and ultimately reach the conclusion that we are not sure. Um, and Isidemus is on the right path. I think the 10 modes could be reduced to three modes. I have explained this um, uh, in my writings. But anyway, the point is that um, through skepticism, we can always, uh, we always try to rid ourselves of a certain falsehood that we have, and that is the falsehood of certainty, the falsehood that we know things, we just know everything. And because we pretend that we know everything, we often uh, find uh, ourselves in troublesome situations, situations that are caused by our hubris. This is another word that I have uh, covered in some uh, videos that I have done recently and also in writings. Uh, hubris is when we no longer recognize our limits and we escape our limits. One such limit is the fact that we are not omniscient. And when we think that we know everything, we are committing hubris. So when you start um, assuming a skeptical disposition, when you are being inspired by uh, this idea that maybe we don't know anything, maybe we should give the other side the benefit of the doubt. When you are, in other words, dubitative, dubitative, and the word for that is aporetic, there is an English word for that, uh, which is uh, the Greek word, uh, aporia, aporetic. And if you are dubitative, if you are inquisitive, inquisitive, and the word for that, the Greek word for that, again, with an English uh, version, zetetic, and this is from uh, zito, anazito, which is to search when you are inquiring about the nature of things, when you are dubitative, when you are inquisitive, when you are open minded, what we discussed uh, earlier, like you don't want to assume that you know everything and the other side is wrong in advance. So when you are dialectical, when you are willing to engage in a process of thesis, and counter thesis, counter thesis, else antithesis, in order 
to arrive at the synthesis. Synthesis means the merging of two uh, opposing theses, of two opposing views. So when you are dialectical, when you are dubitative, when you are inquisitive, and when you are the last virtue, when you are conducting yourself in parisia, again, this, these are English words, I'm not just inventing them, these are borrowed from Greek, but they ex exist in English, uh, parisia, I, I'm not sure if it's written like this with a double R, by the way. But anyway, you, you can find it, Parisia. I also have it. Uh, see, this is the problem. That I have to check now. Uh, let's go. Uh, let's... Um, dialecticians ethos. Parisia. Okay, so yeah, it's uh, with a double R, I am correct. You can check, by the way, this article. Uh, the Dialecticians ethos, in case you are interested. So, parisia means to have presence, to speak your mind, to uh, share your views without fear, to speak the truth, to speak what you think is the truth, with the recognition that you are dubitative, that you are inquisitive, that you are dialectical. So, when you conduct yourself in this way, you are no longer committing hubris, no more hubris. So, no more hubris no more exceeding exceeding our limits so when we do this i i will return to the point of uh, the overlap between stoicism and uh, buddhism right now when you have this disposition you begin to have an attitude towards life where nothing bothers you anymore you are not bothered by the fact that you are you don't know you are not bothered that the fact that something outside your control is in fact outside your control. And uh, those sorts of things that Stoics also talk about. And this is this, this leads to a state of mind known as ataraxia, else tranquility, else tranquility. There is another word uh, for, the, for it which is um, I forget the the word now. Uh, I will remember. I forget it, but I will remember it now. Uh, but uh, equanimity, no, I think equanimity, equanimity. I'm not sure. Maybe this. Uh, let, let's uh, let's ignore. I will uh, look it up. But basically, ataraxia means that you understand now from a position of knowledge. You understand what your limits are. For example, the fact that you don't control other people, that's your limits, the limits of your nature. But by understanding it, you no longer um, are in a state of anxiousness about the fact that you don't control other people. So you come to a state of ataraxia. So when you no longer commit hubris, again, from a position of knowledge, you return to this. So these are the kind of themes that also the Stoics uh, worked on. And of course, uh, in different words and through a different tradition, we find similar ideas in uh, Buddhism. And I am actually um, studying uh, Buddhism now. I am interested to learn more. Uh, I'm still a beginner. So of course, I, I cannot say... Uh, what sorts uh, of uh, overlaps exist or, or how big is the overlap. So I'm just mentioning it now that I have noticed it uh, as well. So there is Stoicism, there is Pyrrhonism, there is, again, I will mention it here. Uh, it is kind of a bad word in the modern world, but I will uh, mention it. Cynicism. Cynicism is kind of a negative word nowadays, even though at the time, it wasn't really negative. It was uh, uh, about living uh, simply, about not being attached to external things. And this is something that monks do, for example. Whether they are monks in Greek Orthodox Christianity or Buddhist monks or whatever, they are, in a sense, cynics, in the sense that they are living a simple life, a life that is... Uh, uh, one of non-attachment uh, to um, uh, transient things, to temporal things, to the world uh, around them. 
And there is a lot to say about cynicism. Of course, the Ogenis of Sinope. The Ogenis of Sinope. Sinope is a city in modern day uh, Turkey. Uh, and the Diogenes was from there. The Diogenes, also known as the Cynic. Uh, the word Cynic, by the way, Kinas, is the ancient Greek word for dog. So those were dogs. So that was a derogatory term, but they took pride in that term. And as a dog person myself, uh, calling someone a dog should actually be a positive because dogs are wonderful uh, beings in more ways than one. But anyway, the Ogenis of uh, Sinope uh, must have uh, influenced, uh, influenced uh, Zenon of Kitium, so the first uh, story. Uh, so there is, of course, a, a tradition. That's the point I am making. There is a tradition in uh, ancient Greek. The more you study the ancient Greek philosophers, the more you will notice that basically they are part of the same tradition. There are different schools of thought, but they are not really uh, opposites. So they are uh, complementary to each other. You can, if you are eclectic, you can be a cynic and a stoic, a cynic and a pyrrhonist. You can be Platonist or Aristotelian or whatever. It's um, later uh, commentators who tried to make those clear distinctions like Either you are with Plato or you are with Aristotle. You cannot be with both. I think that is not really uh, constructive. I think you can be eclectic and you can uh, pick and choose from multiple sources. So, yeah, just um, uh, uh, an aside on the overlap between Stoicism and Buddhism. I think it is there for sure. And it also runs deeper the more you uh, uh, study things. Uh, where are we now? Because I lost uh, the chat. Um, yeah, okay, so we are here. Uh, Prot, there is quite some lag before you see chat messages. Uh, you should switch to live mode instead of the current top chat mode. It's a drop down at the top of your chat window. Let me see. So, ah, okay, I had no idea. So it's what I mentioned earlier that I'm not really... Um, uh, savvy when it comes to the um, production quality of those videos so i just uh, do it and whatever works but uh, thanks for that uh, tamash um and so we are live chat now so i guess i guess the other one is just supposed to be moderated or uh, something like that right uh, so let's see hello world hello to you too uh what do we have here the problem is not always just a prejudice, but also biased information available easily. Yes, of course, that's true, what Ihor says here. Sometimes dedicated efforts are needed to find alternative opinions on a topic. Yes, yes, that's I agree. I agree for sure. Um, related to this, um, the more you read, the more you get, uh, um, the more you develop kind of an instinct on uh, identifying information that is a bit fishy, as we say. It's uh, not always easy, but uh, sometimes you, you can tell. But if you have this disposition of being um, aporetic, of being dubitative, we have here, inquisitive, and so on, if you have this disposition, even if you come across some misinformation, you will not provide assent to it right away with uh, closed eyes like oh, okay yes yeah, this is the truth let's ignore everything else instead you will be like the ideal judge if you will who will try to listen to all sides of the argument and will not um, uh, try to make a judgment without all the information available so that's the kind of mindset that you have but of course you need to be careful of misinformation or disinformation so you don't want uh, that and that's another uh, good reason why it's always useful to just study the sources directly so don't study what someone comments about for example aristotle study aristotle directly not that the commentary is not useful but it's always uh, good to have the original uh, you know straight to you or 
whatever the, the original that we have at least whatever survived the, the test of time uh, 20 second lag okay that's too much uh, hopefully uh, it will improve now that I switch to the live what's it called live chat uh, mode uh, so where are we uh, diversity of thought and openness to reasonable discussion not debate is uh, what society needs I agree I think in my last uh, live stream or the one before I'm not sure um, someone mentioned that I should do let's write it here now so in case you want to see I should do a debate with Luke sorry Luke Smith and uh, I um, focused a bit on the word debate of course I am happy again what I said about uh, DistroTube or uh, System Crafters David Wilson I it applies if if there was a chance to do a video with Luke I would be happy about it but not a debate and uh, the reason for that is that the word debate has acquired a specific meaning nowadays where it basically means a fight between people. So you have one politician on one side of the panel, another politician on the other side of the panel, and they have a couple of minutes each to basically ridicule the other side. It's like one, two, three fight. And you watch them uh, exchange uh, barbs. I don't want that. I am not interested in debates of that sort i think it has no place in uh, any kind of uh, reasonable uh, discussion if however we mean that we mean dialogue we mean what i said here dialectics so if we mean that we will discuss our views and we will try to see uh, what points uh, of agreement we have or whether there is some uh, truth in uh, our opposing views that we can uh, approximate then of course i would be very happy for that um, as i have said many times before i am uh, i maintain the kind of attitude where i am glad to be proven wrong I, this may sound a bit strange but and a bit hypocritical but i really mean it if you show me that i am wrong that's a good thing you are doing me a service you are like a friend because you are helping me escape from a, a falsehood from an idea that i had that was holding me back so by showing me that i am wrong you uh, emancipate me so that's always something to bear in mind that's again ataraxia again we return to the same things uh, uh, the more you uh, analyze them um scratch buffer in uh, uh, markdown or not org Ah, yes, this uh, is in Markdown, and the reason I have it in Markdown is because uh, I often have to write on the um, issue trackers of GitLab or GitLab where they don't use org. So this is how I use the scratch buffer. But this one is with a prefix argument. So I press Control U, Control C, and then the letter S. So it uh, produces a scratch uh, buffer. Uh, but uh, normally, if you just do Control C and S, this is a command of mine, it will use whatever major mode you are in. So uh, sometimes I am, uh, let's uh, go to, I don't know now. Let's go, for example, I am here and I want a scratch buffer for the Emacs uh, Lisp mode. I will just do it and I have scratch, you see scratch for Emacs, Emacs Lisp uh, mode. If I am in org mode, it will do for org mode and so on. So this is how I normally use it. But with a prefix argument, it's uh, defaulting to markdown. And with a double prefix argument, so control U, control U and control CS, it is asking me for a major mode so I can uh, use uh, org mode uh, in this case. But not to belabor the point, you get the idea. Let's go here because this might be more useful. Um, sorry, where we are? What desktop environment do you use, says other interests? Ever use any kind of window manager? Uh, I mentioned this uh, before the before the official uh, beginning of the live stream. I am using um, Herbs, Herbst Luft WM right now. Uh, and the reason for that is because Herbst Luft uh, WM lets you uh, designate a portion of the screen and mark it as a monitor, so to speak. So because right now I'm using an uh, ultra-wide display, I have 
uh, a portion here which is monitor one so to speak and then uh, on the side i have the nominal uh, monitor two of course it is one display but uh, you can uh, partition it uh, nominally so that's very nice otherwise i was using uh, uh, the binary space partitioning window manager bsp wm both of them are very similar uh, and in fact i configure them in a way that is virtually identical so they share a lot of code uh, and you can uh, find this uh, in my dot files uh, you can see that I have uh, something specific to BSPWM, something about Herbsluft WM, and then I have this uh, Xorg uh, TW uh, over here. Uh, so you can uh, see uh, how that works. Those are the common uh, parts. Uh, I have also configured the Sway. I used the Sway for a while, but um, because the pure GTK branch of Emacs has still not been merged into master, um, pure GTK will make Emacs work natively on uh, Wayland. Because of that, I am not using Sway for now. I will uh, reconsider it once PGTK is merged uh, into Emacs. So yes, Herbsluft WM for the time being. Uh, let's see uh, what uh, we have. So yes, prod used uh, to use uh, BSPWM. So yes, BSPWM before, Herbsluft WM right now. Um, both are very similar and I think if you like the one you will probably like the other. Herbsluft WM is more manual though, whereas BSPWM has an automatic uh, tiling scheme which I think is better for most cases. Uh, yes, and I mentioned that at the beginning indeed. Uh, JTR Ramblings and Thoughts says, Hi Prod. Oh, hello, hello there. Uh, sorry, wanted to do break the line. Uh, ah, yeah, okay, that's okay. My question is, do you study philosophy on your own? If you do, is this true for how you study other areas in your life by yourself, uh, by your own means, so not taking a class? Um, yes, I am uh, self-taught uh, when it comes to philosophy uh, and also to other things as well, but specifically uh, philosophy, since you are asking. The way this started with philosophy is kind of inter interesting because I went to the university to study um, European politics, economics, and law. Uh, some background here. When I was a teenager, I wasn't really good uh, at school. I didn't really care because I was playing football semi-professionally. Uh, so uh, I had all those uh, perks. Uh, and um, basically, I was on to become a professional uh, football player, soccer player. So my mind was elsewhere, but definitely not... Uh, 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 in, in the classroom. Uh, so uh, I went to the university to study uh, European politics, not because I had any interest in politics, but because it, um, it was about Europe and I thought, okay, maybe I can, um, I, I, I can make use of my language skills. So I, I spoke, uh, I, I knew English and French, I speak French as well. Um, so I thought, okay, this is Europe, uh, England, France, etc. We will see how everything fits together. I had no idea. So I started with my university studies. And uh, actually, once I put my mind to it, I was good at them. Uh, I, I got uh, first honors, so that sort of thing. It doesn't matter. I don't really care about degrees per se, but it uh, is what happened. Anyhow, uh, I already uh, had at the university uh, this tendency to philosophize, to uh, theorize and to abstract. Uh, so um, uh, one time uh, I was writing uh, an essay uh, for uh, an assignment and uh, I did my own thing. Basically, I just um, uh, took some uh, references from some book, but then went my own way. So I, without quoting any uh, sources. So it was just my ideas uh, at the time. And the professor noted that uh, tendency of mine to philosophize and was like, uh, do you realize that um, if you don't provide the citations, you will lose 5% uh, of your mark? Uh, and um, at the time, I didn't uh, mean to sound arrogant or to offend anyone. Uh, but what I said is, uh, don't worry, I will still get an A. Uh, 
because the A is from 90 to 100, 90% 90 to 100. So I was like, don't worry, I will get an A. Let me do my own thing. And I continued to do my own thing. And uh, eventually I realized that I was mostly gravitated towards the abstract and the philosophical. So this kind of uh, came out of me uh, on its own. It was like a, a self-realization. I didn't know that about myself uh, before. And of course, once I fully understood the implications of it, uh, I had to change uh, my life. I had to change many things in my life. And uh, so I had to uh, switch careers away from politics because politics is all about debate, what we uh, mentioned before. Uh, about debate, whereas philosophy is not about debate, it's not about attacking people, it's about uh, finding, uh, uh, clarifying our thoughts and trying to approximate the truth. So I had to uh, move away from my career in uh, politics. I was working uh, at the European Parliament as a um, policy analyst. I was an assistant to a Portuguese member of the European Parliament for the Greens uh, slash EFA group. But that's all in the past. It doesn't matter anymore. Uh, so yes, on my own, uh, philosophy on my own. And um, I, I do read philosophy, of course, but mostly I write philosophy or I practice philosophy. And that's important because it is one thing to read. You can read about everything, whatever you want. But it's another to uh, commit to it, to make a lifestyle out of it. And um, what I just said about uh, being happy to be proven wrong, this is not just something that I say uh, to make you think that I am some kind of a good uh, person or whatever. This is how I conduct myself with my neighbors. This is how I operate in my daily life. It's not something that I do once I sit in my armchair and, you know, the, that kind of stereotype uh, of the philosopher in some, you know, faraway place, in some ivory tower, aloof from the fray, not having any connection with uh, the world and just philosophizing about, um, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of thought experiments. So I prefer to put my ideas to practice. And this is also good to do because then you realize what kind of uh, ideas are uh, realistic, are, are applicable, and uh, which ideas are not. It helps to have uh, a sense uh, of things in that way. So yes, that's uh, the basic uh, idea. Of course, I am not against the formal studies in philosophy. Of course, that would be ridiculous. If you can do formal studies, that, uh, that's uh, good. Nothing wrong with that. It's just um, uh, that every person is different and for example, when you ask an artist, why do you do your art? That's, that's the kind of answer that asks them, why are you the way you are? It's not your decision. You were born an artist. So in, in that way, I was born with this propensity uh, to be attracted to the more abstract things. It's not something that I woke up one day and I said, okay, let's become a philosopher. So it's, it wasn't like that. It, it came out organically. Um, math says, math alphabet, I have some opinions about how Buddhism, uh, I, I am looking forward to hearing yours. Uh, for the time being, I don't have opinions about the Buddhism because uh, I am a beginner. So I am just studying. I am curious. I am interested to learn more. Uh, and uh, we will see how it goes. Uh, I, and generally, my opinions always have an asterisk, as it were. It's always with the proviso that I will change my mind. So there is always that. Uh, so my opinions are not really something to live by. And this is something I also write uh, in my on my website. So don't follow me. I don't like this idea of let's follow what that person is doing. Because that person doesn't know where they are going. So don't follow me. I am just experimenting. This is all a work in progress. Uh, so uh, let's see what we have. By the way, uh, we have been going for two hours now. So I think we should uh, close the stream at some point. We have some more comments here. I will answer those. But then we should uh, close uh, because it's uh, more than two hours now. So 
uh, we don't want to go and uh, go on forever uh, thank you uh, for the short lesson uh, i will check more about it and check your blog later definitely uh, you are welcome uh, unfortunately uh, criticism is often uh, frowned on these days on the basis that it can hurt another person even in science people tend to remain silent rather than providing criticism and this is what Ihor says uh, and that's unfortunate of course there is a fine line between uh, criticism and uh, bullying sometimes this line is uh, not so obvious because there is a way in how you do criticism right. You don't attack the other person's capabilities, the other person's uh, intentions or whatever. You are just trying to be constructive. But oftentimes, and this is something that we also see even in Emacs, uh, even in, for example, the development of Emacs, you, when someone sends a patch, you want to stick to the point of what the patch is and to say, okay, this is what I like about the patch, this is what I don't like. You want to treat it on its own merits. You don't want to go around and attack people and uh, try to undermine them. When you do that sort of thing, that sort of bullyism, then of course, that's not what we want. Uh, but uh, the, the point is that silence, so not trying to criticize anyone because they will hurt their feelings, Silence is also pro problematic. And also the idea of hurting your feelings. What I said about here earlier about ataraxia, why are your feelings hurt when someone criticizes an opinion of yours? The opinion is not an extension of yourself. It's something that may be wrong. It's in your head. And if you think about it, maybe you will let go of it. So why do you hurt about having your opinion being exposed. Again, what I said earlier about bullism, we don't want bullism, but also we don't want silence either. We want criticism. Criticism is healthy in every society. We don't want silence uh, to become the norm and then for those who speak to be in a monologue with themselves and to impose their own uh, will. That's not good because then we have a kind of a monoculture of thought. And as with monoculture in agriculture, as with monoculture everywhere, that is detrimental to our longer term sustainability. So we don't want that. Uh, let's see some uh, final uh, points uh, over here before we uh, close this um, live stream. Rant Poison and uh, Stamp WM in Lisp uh, also uh, have a manual like Herbsluft uh, WM. Uh, yes, Stamp WM, I know that uh, David from System Crafters uh, is experimenting with that. Uh, I think I used it uh, maybe last year, I'm not sure. I used it briefly. Uh, I liked the idea of it, but I didn't stick with it. So uh, I, maybe I will try it again. The fact that it is in a Lisp is good, but also I don't really mind uh, doing it with a shell script or whatever, because I know shell scripting at least enough to get things to work. So I don't really mind uh, that. Of course, if we could have everything inside of Emacs and if everything were to work perfectly, which EXD EXWM doesn't work uh, perfectly, but if we could have everything inside of Emacs, yes, of course, why not? Um, uh, why not EXWM? Because you are running an Emacs inside of an Emacs and if you want to restart Emacs then you are in trouble and uh, that's uh, not uh, good. Uh, but yes, otherwise EXWM is uh, fine. Also, I don't like the idea of tying uh, my Emacs to my window manager because there might be a case where I will need to switch on the computer and not use Emacs. I might want to, maybe there is a guest and I want to uh, have them, I don't know, browse uh, YouTube. So I don't want them to use Emacs. I don't want them to use a tiling window manager or whatever. So I don't want to really um, tie things like that. Not that there are guests coming here, but <laughs> just saying. Uh, 
Uh, Garjola says, hi, Prot. I am very late for the live stream. Don't worry, the, it will be recorded. I uh, just want to say hello and thank you for all your work. You are welcome. Uh, Prot, then what is your means of economic wealth? Um, I work part-time. I do very, various uh, part-time jobs in the area, mainly farming, but uh, occasionally there will be something to do uh, with uh, construction or something like that. But usually it's manual labor. Uh, so it's that. Uh, hopefully uh, conditions will improve because, of course, uh, having a stable source of income is better than all those part-time jobs. But, okay, I won't complain about it because it was my decision to come to the mountains. But, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, living philosophy is praiseworthy. Uh, to maybe uh, misquote Musonius Rufus, for philosophy to be of use to anyone, one must practice it. Uh, and I uh, share that, I agree with that. Joao, hello there. Hey there, Prot. Uh, looking more and more like a wise Emacs wizard, and that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, still, my hair, my beard, and everything are black, so I have to work on uh, gray bearding before I can be a wizard, I guess. I guess it's a prerequisite, right? You have to be gray beard to be a wizard. At least if we go by the Lord of the Rings or something. Um, thank you very much for the stream. You are welcome, Tim. Uh, thank you. You are welcome. Take care, everyone. Uh, so, yes, uh, last points here and we are closing. Uh, I won't uh, follow you. I would maybe meta follow you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's um, a, a meta comment. <laughs> a funny fact, says Ihor. When I was doing my undergraduate, I attended a philosophy club. The philosophy students there often used references to famous philosophers as arguments. Uh, I think that's wrong. Uh, I don't know what kind of arguments and what sort of philosophers, but I think that is wrong in principle because you are saying that my opinion is true because Aristotle says so, or Plato says so, or whoever. And I think uh, that's wrong when you, uh, when you appeal to some authority, that's always wrong. The argument must stand on its own ground, regardless of who the person is. And of course, we should never, never, here is another word for you since you asked for new words, high geography, high geography. We should never commit the error of uh, making a high, high geographic depiction of people. So this means to turn them into um, uh, idols, into saints and uh, add a halo around them and uh, sanctify them and say that there is nothing wrong about them. There could never be anything wrong that they said. For example, Aristotle, you, you should not have a high geographic uh, a, a understanding of Aristotle. Aristotle was fallible like everyone else and was trying to conduct himself in a philosophical way, dubitative, inquisitive, all that sorts of things. So to appeal to Aristotle as an authority, you are exactly committing this error and this is uh, problematic. But we want to close the stream, so not to belabor the point. In science, the opinion uh, is also a sign of uh, professionalism. One can view criticism as attack on personal professionalism. Yeah, uh, this is uh, the thing with um, uh, taking your opinion as your um, social standing, as your work, because then you are attached to your opinion. It's exactly the opposite of what we said here, exactly the opposite of ataraxia. Because you become, uh, you make the opinion an extension of yourself. You cling on to what the opinion or your view or your status or whatever has to offer. And by clinging on to it, you suffer. You suffer because you are not recognizing your limits. You are not recognizing that this is external to you, that you can let go of it and not lose anything really anything real. But uh, I have uh, an essay on um, science and uh, scientism. 
maybe we can see here science uh, notes on science and scientism so you can uh, check that as well if you are uh, curious uh, but why does it not have numbers i think it should have numbers now i'm curious because i these were numbered notes uh, i have to check now very quickly uh, science and scientism Ah, no, so it was like that, pre-form notes. I thought I had uh, numbered them, but apparently I didn't. Uh, so, yeah, so there is that as well, if you want to uh, take a look uh, at it. I am, of course, in favor of science, but uh, I think that uh, scientists as well would benefit a lot from um, philosophy, from being more philosophical in their disposition. It's not to say that it is either or. It is both. You want both. Um, Joao says, I know you're willing to close the stream, but I'd like to ask what are your opinions on uh, cynicism and preach by the Oyenis. In general, I am in uh, favor of the Oyenis. Uh, there are uh, some anecdotes about the Oyenis, like he was masturbating in public and stuff like that. I don't know if it's true. If it's true, I don't agree with it. If it's not true, then it comes from the opponents of the Oyenis. But anyway, it's not pertinent to the uh, philosophy of the Oyenis, uh, which was a philosophy about living uh, the simple life. I'm trying to find now the... Uh, the where is it? Uh, let me find it one second. The dialectician's ethos. The Oyenis, there is a reference to the Oyenis in the Dialectician's Ethos in my essay, and it is about being a citizen of the cosmos, of the world, and I explain what that means because cosmopolit, cosmopolitanism, and those uh, terms uh, are often uh, misunderstood. To cosmopolitis, this is often uh, misunderstood, so I uh, touch on that uh, idea as well. But in general, I am uh, I am favor in favor of the Oyenis. I am in favor of cynicism. I don't think cynicism historically, right? I mean the school of thought. I don't mean the modern use of the word. So the school of thought, I am of course uh, in favor of it. I look at it positively. But again, we are not high geographic. We are not doing a high geography of the Oyenis. We are not saying the Oyenis was perfect. None of that, of course. Um, oh, I see you have uh, you have it as a point in Scratch already. If you already talked about it, I go and watch the recording. I mentioned it, but of course you can check the recording, but you can also check the dialectician's ethos here. Uh, maybe one day I will do, uh, I will write about it or I will do a video, I don't know, about um, the citizen of the world, this notion of uh, to cosmopolitis, cosmopolitis, cosmopolit, cosmopolitanism and so on. I will elaborate uh, at some point. Uh, I really like your videos. First time watching a live stream of yours. I'll make sure to watch the next ones. Take care, Prof. Uh, you're welcome. You can always find the, um, the text of those streams uh, on my website, protesilaos.com. Uh, so uh, there is that as well. Uh, and uh, you can uh, check the details there. Image quality dropping when scrolling big chance of hangs low bit rate says yuri uh sorry about that i'm not sure what is going on maybe because i brought the my face here in the middle uh, i don't know what is happening but i will keep that in mind and i will make sure not to repeat it so anyway folks let's uh, close this uh, presentation uh, today i think we have been going for two and a half hours or something like that so let's call it a day and i will see you next time maybe i will do another video before the end of this month i don't know actually but maybe there will be another one before the end of this month otherwise uh, with the new year we will see how it goes so that's all uh, for today folks i think we have covered everything i don't think i missed anyone but if i missed some comment here uh, please let me know and i will make sure to uh, answer it uh, via email uh, so that's all for today folks thank you very much for your attention goodbye